And what about this phrase? 15 million people heard Ted Danson proclaim his love of fish on Earth Day for the last few years and every other day since 1987, and yet he eats them. For all those years, and no offense to Mr. Danson, please, and maybe things have changed recently, but for him and 98% of all other individuals in the world, this phrase, I love fish, actually means this. I love to eat fish, doesn't it? Yeah, that's what he really means. If he loved fish, as in loving his cat or his dog, he certainly wouldn't kill and eat them, would he? I don't think so. <laughs> Again, thank you. Again, it's, it's how we use our words, isn't it? In fact, Oceana's objectives, one of the most influential conservation organizations in the world, their objectives were made very clear last year in an interview where their spokesperson, Mr. Danson, stated, it's not about saving the fish. It's about saving the fishermen. And that explains quite a bit. There are three principal ways our oceans are being destroyed, and all three are caused or at least heavily affected by our food choice. Raising and eating animals on land causes warming and acidification of our oceans, which are just trying to protect us. 90% of the excess heat added to Earth's climate since the 1960s, 90% has been stored in our oceans, which is triggering extreme weather events and killing sea life. More than 50% of all excessive greenhouse gases have been absorbed by our oceans, which has dropped pH levels by 30%, making it difficult for certain species to survive. Surface runoff from livestock operations on land has caused more than 500 nitrogen-flooded dead zones around the world, comprising 95,000 square miles of areas completely devoid of life. So any meaningful discussion of the state of our oceans has to first begin with frank discussions about land-based animal agriculture. But... It is fishing that has the largest impact of all. Incredibly large amounts of sea life are taken from our oceans in three ways. First, they're taken as target fish. You know, that's, that's the one you want to eat. They're also taken out of, our, out of our oceans to feed other fish grown on factory fish farms, part of the aquaculture movement. And lastly, fish are taken as bykill due to the first two types of, of fishing. Oh, that really doesn't leave too much in our oceans now, does it? <laughs> in fact, our oceans are being ravaged. Now, now, who here doesn't know that, that our oceans are being ravaged? Well, if everyone, if everyone knows this, why does everyone we know still eat fish? <laughs> Fragile, interdependent, and poorly understood ecosystems have been devastated. Over 90 million tons of fish were caught last year with quite a few more millions of tons of bycale, which are all those other innocent sea life caught and killed and discarded, in the process of trying to catch that targeted fish everyone's asking for. Bykill includes juvenile fish, all seven of the endangered sea tur turtles, sea lions, birds, dolphins, even, even whales. I mean, come on, is that, really, is that really worth it? This is embarrassing. Of the 17 major fishing stock areas in the world, all of them are either overexploited or on the verge of collapse. 85% of all the world's fish species are affected considered heavily depleted from overfishing practices. Well, that, that's quite a bit of damage. But, but along comes this word, sustainable, to justify continued harvesting. We can just stamp that word on anything, and then we can continue in the take, take, take mode, and we can feel good about it. Why? Well, because it's sustainable. <laughs> now, how is that word even used in the fishing industry? Who defines it? Who monitors it? And with less than 1% of our oceans being regulated, uh-huh, less than 1% of our oceans being regulated, who decides on enforcement? If you look at this carefully, the real answer is no one. And I say real answer because now there's sea life caught and labeled sustainable when in fact it's not. But it's still labeled as such by a number of highly respected organizations such as the Marine Stewardship Council or MSC. And there are many, many examples of this. Tuna, cod, pollock, haddock, salmon, krill, menhaden, hake. I mean, just so many. The Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch, a highly respected organization, has lobster from the Gulf of Maine, both, both U.S. and Canada waters, not too far from here, listed as a good alternative. They've had it listed as a good alternative for years, but it's not. It never has been a good alternative for many reasons. Rapidly declining number of lobster, inefficient trapping mechanisms, and most importantly is the sad effect lobster trapping has on the critically endangered North Atlantic right whale. There are only 400 
of these truly magnificent creatures left that we haven't killed. And nearly all of them, 80% of them, are getting entangled, injured, and killed in those trap lines. We owe these whales and lobsters much more than this. Look closely, please. This young female North Atlantic right whale died shortly after this photograph was taken, found on a beach in Florida, essentially tortured, towing these lobster trap lines desperately along her migration route of over 2,000 miles from Canada, where she originally became entangled on her fins, on her body, on her tail, in her mouth, around her head. What a struggle this must have been for her. And this is not an isolated incident. It happens all the time, which is why I'm showing it to you. So eating lobster is sustainable for whom? Elsewhere in the world, there have been an estimated 500 miles, 500 miles of non-biodegradable fishing nets cut loose from fishing vessels each year. 500 miles each year for the past 25 years, catching countless numbers of unsuspecting sea life, essentially becoming depots of coagulated dead marine animals. You know, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch is aptly named because that's exactly what they're doing. They're watching all this happen while promoting it to be continued. Each year, <laughs> that's right, each year more than 300,000 whales, dolphins, and porpoises are killed in fishing gear. This is just one of the many prices we pay for someone at your table or my table eating fish, eating fish that's now labeled as sustainable. And so it is with fishing under the sustainable label. Target fish are becoming extinct. We move on to the next fish in line, creating cereal depletion. And then other sea life up and down the food web are becoming extinct, all part of the collateral damage that begins with us. And what is this? Uh, <laughs> don't ask me. I, don't, I only know a few things about it because the world's leading scientists don't know much about it. But that didn't stop it from becoming certified as sustainable. Now, how does that happen? How can something become sustainable when you don't know anything about it? <laughs> only we could do that. Uh, this is the Ross Sea toothfish, more than 5,000 tons are uh, now caught per year. Many more thousands of tons caught illegally, and yet no one knows where they breed or spawn. <laughs> As of last year, no one had even seen a young toothfish. And bluefin tuna represent all that we're doing wrong with our oceans. A little over a year ago, the ruling was made to not grant an, in an endangered status to them, even though their numbers had dropped by 95%. They are already extinct in the Black and Caspian Seas. Yeah, they don't need any help. Instead of eating dolphin-free tuna, we should be concerned about eating simply tuna-free. <laughs> this, this is an approved, sustainable method of catching tuna, in case anybody wondered. Coral reef systems around the world are in serious trouble. The Great Barrier Reef has lost more than half of its coral cover since 1985. Most would think it's due to pollution and climate change, which have something to do with it. But the primary cause of coral reef death through the throughout the entire Caribbean region anyway, and most of the rest of the world, is not pollution. It's not from climate change. It's from overfishing. An example in the other direction can be found in the Queens Islands off the southern coast of Cuba, where they haven't allowed commercial fishing. Their coral reef ecosystems today look the same as they have for the past thousands of years. One of the most important factors in balancing coral reef systems are predatory fish, or apex feeders like sharks, but we're killing them too quite a few of them. One third of all shark species are nearing extinction. We're killing nearly 100 million sharks per year. Why? Well, 40 million sharks have their fins cut off, like this one, and then they're thrown overboard to die so we can eat shark fin soup. It's terrible to see this, isn't it? But I know what you're thinking. You're saying to yourself, I don't eat shark fin soup. <laughs> no, not me. And, and, for, and furthermore, it's banned in eight states in our country, including our state of New York, which happened last year. So that's nice to see. So congratulations. Well, isn't that great? But, again, over 98% of us do eat fish. And by eating fish, any type of fish, we're doing this to 60 million sharks that are caught each year and killed in fishing nets and fishing lines as bykill. So go ahead and ban <laughs> shark fin soup all you want. <laughs> but why stop there? If you're truly concerned about sharks, you should ban fishing. 
Killing krill now has become a very big business. But you don't need to eat krill to get your omega-3s. You don't need to eat any sea life to get your omega-3s. Uh, unless, of course, you listen to Dr. Oz. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, however, krill, <laughs> krill is fundamental to the survival of almost every animal species in and around the Antarctic. Krill numbers have dropped by 78% since 1980, in turn affecting the decline of a number of penguin species and making it very difficult for baleen whales such as blue, right, and fin. A large pod of pilot whales, 22 of them, beached themselves in the Florida Keys a little over a month ago. The cause of death was most likely malnutrition since it was found that they had no food in their stomachs. These whales eat mackerel, herring, and lots of squid, all of which we fish to an overexploited state. There are hardly any left. This is a perfect example of the cascading effect we have on other life as we continue to eat sea animals, taking away the food supply from other species that actually do need to eat Squid. <laughs> the most heavily killed fish species in the world is the Alaskan pollock, harvested at a rate of 3 million tons per year, and yet it's still labeled as sustainable. Now, who would think, who would think you could take 3 million tons of any species from anywhere on Earth and think they wouldn't be missed somehow? Now, here's the point regarding our oceans. It's no longer a problem of overfishing. Now, that was way back in the mid-1800s. It's about fishing. Whole Foods, Walmart, Wegmans, Compass Group, Aramark have pledged to phase out Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch red-listed seafood in the next couple of years. At the end of the day, though, it's not really about a pledge from big business. No, it's about how accurately the word sustainable is being defined and then being used. Well, no worries, because now we have fish farms. <laughs> 49% of all fish consumed worldwide are produced from aquaculture, which is growing faster than any other food sector. One reason for this tremendous growth is the very false illusion of environmentalism. Asia now produces 91% of all farm fish in the world. Shrimp, tilapia, carp, with the vast majority of operations being completely unregulated. Here we have another interesting idea where fish are caught in our already ravaged oceans to feed other fish produced on factory fish farms, sometimes at a ratio of 20 to 1, in the form of fish, fish meal, fish oil. 88% of all fish oil produced in the world is now given to these fish farms. Very soon, we will run out of fish in our oceans, and we will likely run out of land to raise livestock. So we could be turning to this, a more closed-loop system of aquaculture called aquaponics, a combination of aquaculture and hydroponics that grows both fish and plants, Businesses are already snatching up abandoned industrial warehouses in many urban settings. This happens to be in Chicago. Raising fish in tanks, growing vegetables with the wastewater, and then cycling it back to the, to the fish. But they all use massive amounts of electricity. They use an incredibly massive amount of feed inputs. And these are essentially adulterated forms of plant-based hydroponics or aeroponics. Regardless of where the fish on your plate comes from, now or in the future, is the process of catching and harvesting or and then slaughtering fish, is that process humane? And if it isn't, <laughs> then why do we do it? Does anyone know what nociceptors are? Especially polymodal nociceptors. They're, they're sensory receptors associated with feeling pain. You have them. Most mammals have numerous polymodal nociceptors in and around their face, their head, their neck. So do fish. Last year, Cornell became the first Ivy League school to be MSC certified sustainable. Quite a distinct honor, wouldn't you say? Yeah, that's right. Cornell has now joined other distinguished health conscious organizations such as McDonald's. <laughs> which was the first fast food chain to be MSC certified. Both examples of just how far away we are with steps toward true sustainability. All researchers that are unbiased economically or politically will tell you that there's very little we actually understand about our oceans, that there's an infinite line of connection, a complex web of intertwining life and ecosystems supported by our oceans. It's infinite. Has the fishing industry accounted for, and then devised a calculation of this infinity? 
<laughs> That's not what I learned about infinity years ago. <laughs> In reality, there's no such thing as sustainable commercial fishing. With, with continued warming, acidification, and deoxygenation, our oceans that we once felt were so robust will very soon be unable to support what few life forms remain in and around them. So the timelines for our oceans look like this. This is not science fiction. It's not something I made up on the way over here. It's reality. And quite sadly, this has happened on our watch. You're looking at what we created and then now are passing on to future generations. In fact, what we need is complete and immediate restoration of all oceanic ecosystems back to a balanced state where pluses and minuses occur naturally, not controlled or manipulated by our wants or by an organization influenced by money, which they all are. We want to eat lobster. We want to eat Alas Alaskan pollock, so therefore, they're sustainable. <laughs> the magic pill to heal our sick oceans is not magic at all. It's really quite simple. Just leave them alone. <laughs> 